And as you're turning to Matthew uh, 23, I, I, just a, kind of a refresher of why we're doing the red, what we're calling the Red Words series. Is, you, you know, Calvary chapels, we're known for teaching the whole counsel of God's Word, all 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 31,173 verses, right? We cover the whole deal. Um, and, and having taught through the whole Bible, like Pastor Chuck has encouraged all the guys to do, um, it, it occurred to me, having taught Matthew several times through, that I had never allowed just the words of Christ in red to, to speak. You know, it's like you, you, know, you read the commentaries, you, you listen to all of the other Calvary guys that you love, you use the inductive method to read it over and over and over and all this, and, and you, know, you, you basically just kind of churn out the same stuff as everyone else. And, and this time around, I wanted to approach the red words in the Gospel of Matthew with the mindset of, what did Jesus deal with what did he uh, think was not worth bothering talking about? Because that speaks volumes too, right? And, and, and my thought process was, if we focus more on the words of Christ in red, if we focus more on the words of Jesus than the words of Paul, or Peter, or Moses, or whomever, then maybe we would look more like Jesus in the process. And that's what we've been after in this series. So, Matthew chapter 23, you follow along as I read out loud. <clears throat> then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes, that's the guys that made copies of the, the written scriptures, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and, and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues. Greetings in the marketplaces and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi. For one is your teacher, the Christ. And you are all brethren. And don't call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humiliated. Your Bible says humbled, but that's what it means. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he's one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, 
who say, whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's ob- obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it's nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to to perform it, fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy And faith, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. And woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy, and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you're the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents. Brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed... I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel, the first martyr in the Bible, to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the last martyr of the Old Testament, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Now that's powerful language, isn't it? I mean, Jesus just repeatedly in this Bible study says, whoa, 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 whoa. And, and you know, the Greek word for whoa is oy vey. You ever heard that before? Oy vey, right? Grief and sorrow and lamenting, oy vey, right? And, and this is Jesus looking at the religious experts of his day. And he's looking at how they have gotten off course. I think it's amazing that he begins this whole thing by telling his disciples and the multitudes to obey the teachings of these guys. Don't you think that's amazing? I mean, why not say these guys are phony, they're not practicing anything that they're preaching, so go find yourself another church, right? I mean, isn't that the way of things today? Well, you don't like what I say, uh, you know, you just leave here and go somewhere else, right? Obviously, there's a better place for you to go than here. So let's just let's shop around for the right place to, uh, uh, to, to, to partake of the products and the services of the church, right? Consumerism. It's amazing, this morning, the Pope was speaking about consumerism and how it's destroying things in the Catholic Church. I, it, it, it was amazing to me to, to hear him say things that I've said and, and other Bible teaching pastors have said such things as this. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, I don't want you to follow their walk, but I want you to follow their talk. Why? Well, if you're taking notes, um, we already talked about a scribe as someone who made copies of the Scriptures. Therefore, these guys knew the Scriptures better than, than the ordinary person. They had access to the Scriptures in a way that no one else had. But the Pharisees, the, you know, the, the, this word, the uh, farash, it means separated ones. Separated ones. And, and uh, it was probably meant more as an insult than, than a compliment that they were separate from everybody. But in the beginning, the Pharisees were a pretty tight-knit, solid group of expositors. What? Yeah. The Psalms speaks of Pharisees and speaks of them as having a great zeal and a passion for God's Word. Um, the Pharisees had humble beginnings. Uh, anybody could become a Pharisee. You didn't have to be of a particular tribe of Israel to become a Pharisee. These were not the priestly tribe of Levi. You understand? The Levi, that's the guys at the temple for sacrifices and worship and all this. Pharisees their stomping ground, if you will, was the synagogues, right? They, they, and those were teaching centers all throughout the Roman Empire. Wherever you had ten Jewish men in a city, that was, that's all that it took to justify the building of a new synagogue, right? And the Pharisees were the ones that taught there. They were a lay order of teachers. They had unbelievable study methods, they were the first guys that were like hardcore into hermeneutics, asking the right questions of the text to make sure that you stay in the context and deliver only the, the, the express meaning. So, you, you know, when we have Bible studies today, you, know, we, you, you pass a Bible around the circle and then you ask everybody, what do you think this means? Well, there are two groups of people that would be highly irritated by that method of study. Pharisees and Calvary Chapel pastors. <laughs> because the scripture doesn't mean whatever everybody thinks it means. It's not a consensus thing. It's not a subjective thing. Well, that works for you, but that doesn't work for me. No, 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 no. That's ridiculous. It means what it means. We study it in the original language. These guys were the first ones to really do that. These guys were the hardcore teachers. They didn't have any priestly duties. And in the beginning, they were lenient in judging others. They seemed to be giving more grace than, 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 than law. And, and they just, because they were lay teachers and, and, and all of this. So they started off really great. But over time, everyone say amen if you're tracking with me. Amen. Over time. They stopped living what they were learning. 
And see, the big danger in this church and any other Bible teaching church is for us to define a disciple as someone that is always learning. We can highlight our Bibles, write notes in the margin. But the book of James would speak about us and say that we are always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Whoa. How? How could something like that happen to people that were so serious about the Word? It happens to every movement. That's why we can't be critical of any great denomination or movement of God that is in atrophy today. We, if time allows, will, it'll happen the same thing to us that's happened to every other great movement. And it is arrogant on our part to think that we're going to correct what everybody else has fallen into. To think that we're going to be, you know, uh, um, uh, exempt from the process of atrophy of movements. That's why the Holy Spirit has to constantly raise up new movements. Because the, all, all of us men get old and crusty and set in our ways and it's only our way and we're the only ones that are right and... And we started out with grace, and now we're the only ones. Right? It's a dangerous thing to fall into. Jesus looks at these guys. Their movement is already in atrophy. They're, doing, they're, they're saying all the right stuff, but they're not doing any of it. Now, there are churches across the land that fall into that category, right? Right? They're still preaching the truth, but they're not living it out. And Jesus would say, you need to keep listening to those guys and doing what they're saying, even though they're not doing what they're saying. Why? Because they sit in Moses' seat of authority. Now, in the Old Testament, you had the priests and the temple and the synagogue. That's the Old Testament equivalent of today, pastors and deacons and elders and churches, right? In other words, God does not applaud or encourage rebellion or rebels. He is not for anarchy. He, God will never pat someone on the back that leaves the church because the church is no longer uh, walking the talk. Right? Now yesterday at our men's breakfast, I, I love when the Lord throws me something like this. It was just perfectly suited for this that I was going to be teaching about. One of the brothers shared about a friend that he's been trying to encourage to come to church. And this is a fellow that claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I, I asked if I could share this story, and I was given the green light. So uh, um, he, he, he used to be hardcore in church, says he loves the Lord and all of this, right? He's really good, he was really good friends with the pastor of whatever church. <laughs> it's, I'm not talking about your family. <laughs> This guy was really good friends with the pastor. And the pastor of this church went out fishing without a fishing license and got busted. And the church split over it. They wanted to get rid of him. They, they were just, I, I mean, I laughed when I heard that because I thought, man, it, 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 fishing without a license is the worst thing y'all ever bust me for. Uh, my goodness, right? But the whole church split over this. You know, the congregational church, majority rules. Half of us think you shouldn't have to pay a license anyway. This land is your land, this land is my land. I sing it every 4th of July. I should be able to fish anywhere I want. Right? And then the other half of the church is like, no, we got to obey the laws of men now. And our pastor didn't obey the laws of men. It's like he went out and ran over a child and killed him. Right? I mean, I don't know how they played this thing out. But I have grown up in church and I've heard this kind of garbage Right? And the whole church split over this. Pastor had to leave and all that. And the guy that was friends with the pastor that our brother here has been trying to talk to said, I'm done with church. It's nothing but hypocrites. I'm not going back anymore. <laughs> and the question was posed, you know, what do you think about that, Philip? <laughs> 
and you know, the words flew out of my mouth. I mean, it was morning. I'd only had a couple of cups of coffee. Flesh was not tightly under control yet. Words flew out of my mouth that I have heard my mother say a million times. I just got tickled when they came out of my mouth. I said, well, that guy's a, he just needs to get a life. What a jerk. What a loser. What? No, we need to go back because we've let him down. We've let someone down. That Oh, the church. I, I mean, I can understand why he's given up on all churches everywhere because his church dealt with their pastor the wrong way. Guys, that's just nonsense, right? Who's really the hypocrite in that story? Come on now. Yeah, I've tried to talk nice in years past. I'm just done with it. I'm just going to tell you what I think. People don't stop eating at restaurants because they got a bad meal in one, do they? People don't stop going to Nine Mile Fitness because they see me down there. <laughs> oh, they go in there and they go, this is obviously not a real fitness center. Do you see the hypocrite of that guy over there? <laughs> they go and work out if working out is important to them, Right? I mean, what lame excuses, right? And if you defend this guy and his position and everything, you know what I have to say to you? I love you, but you're a rebel. You're a rebel. And God's Word tells you and I we're supposed to be in church. If we're Christians, we're in church. Well, I can't find a good one. Well, you'll fit in just right because you're no good either. <laughs> and we're all no good, right? Yeah, you know, we are all, we're all a mess. Right? I, just, I, I can only be in a church that teaches the Word of God, Pastor. Are, are you telling me you haven't learned to fish for yourself after all this time? You should be able to feed yourself and go into a church. So if they're not teaching the Word, well, you could start a Bible study and start teaching some pe baby Christians. And one of those. There's no excuse for not being in a church. No excuse what. Soever. Jesus doesn't say because these guys are phony, because they're false, because they're just acting and pretending themselves, give up on the whole system. Jesus doesn't say that. He says you guys need to keep going to synagogue. And you need to listen to those guys. And what they tell you to do, keep doing that stuff. You see, even though they weren't doing it and their heart wasn't in it, these were the first teachers. And they were giving just, they were simply, this is what Chuck used to say, they were simply teaching the Word of God, simply. They weren't doing it themselves. But you could go into one of those synagogues and hear a whole lot of truth. And Jesus said, you need to keep on going. Even though they say, but they don't do. And what was it that they did? Well, the rest of the chapter exposes all of their hypocrisy. They pretend to be godly and they criticize everybody else for failing to do the very things that they're failing to do. They'd make you feel terrible about not reading your Bible last week when they hadn't read their Bible last week. They'd make you feel bad about your prayer life when they hadn't been praying the right way either. Right? That's why if you come on Wednesday nights, you know we have our prayer time. It's kind of like a detox from the world. And the first thing that I always say is, listen, if you haven't had a moment to talk to your Heavenly Father today, I don't want you to feel bad about that. But He wants to hear from you. So bow your head and tell Him how your day went. If I ever get to the point where I'm making you feel bad about not praying, somebody pull me aside and say, Pastor... How's your prayer life? See, because anytime we start putting others down, heavy on the rebukes and not enough encouraging, exhorting, there's an imbalance that talks about that reveals my spiritual life isn't altogether as it should be, right? We should be speaking the truth in love. These guys, they put heavy burdens, verse 4, uh, hard to bear, uh, but they, they didn't help anybody with any of those burdens. Right? In other words, they were not in oversight out of concern for the people, but they simply wanted to control them. They, 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 they didn't really care about the people, right? I mean, how can you tell a wolf in sheep's clothing? Look for the sheep that's feeding on other sheep. That's a wolf, right? Wolves always exploit the sheep. 
Verse 5, he talks about these phylacteries. Did you notice that? But all their works they do to be seen by men, they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. And you say, well, well what's a phylactery? Well, a phylactery was this little leather box, okay? A little leather box with a parchment inside, and it had four columns on this parchment. And there was Exodus 13, Exodus, uh, uh, two passages in Exodus, and two passages in Deuteronomy. They were all about you know, how the word, you need to speak it, need to teach it to your kids, and all this. So they had this little scripture in this little phylactery, this little leather box thing. And they wore this during prayer, one on the middle of their forehead, and the other one on their left arm just above the elbow, right? And the wider the leather strap that held the phylactery in place, the more noticeable the phylactery was, so therefore that guy must be really godly. Now, we look at his teaching like this, and Jesus is, you know, he's talking about these Pharisees, and he's saying, that, hey, they love to have the big leather strap so everybody notices this, you know, big headband thing and the armband. They want everybody to notice that they've been going to prayer. That they've got the scriptures, they're keeping the scriptures as close as humanly possible to their head and their heart, right? You know, and, and, and we look at this and we think, this seems so bizarre, doesn't it? It seems so silly. But we have our phylacteries today, don't we? I mean, growing up in the Baptist church, it was big leather study Bibles. It was ultra modest suits and dresses. That's a Baptist phylactery, right? I mean, can you imagine somebody from 2,000 years ago uh, being able to time travel into, you know, an, an independent Baptist church today and trying to make sense of, of the modern business suit with the tie? I mean, I think, come on now, put yourself in the sandals of somebody in the ancient world. Because huh? I know people think guys look better in suits and ties and all this. But that piece of fabric that you have tied around your neck, in fr what is the point of that? Well, it looks good. I think you're supposed to come in your Sunday best to worship the Lord. Well, do you have a verse to back that up? Because Jesus says, come as you are, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a Baptist phylactery, Right? My dad is still a Southern Baptist pastor after all these years. He wears the suit with the material, the tie, you know, on Sunday morning, and he loses the tie on Sunday night. Whoa. I'm contemporary. I'm, I'm you know, I'm down to earth. It's, and listen, my dad hates all that stuff, that's, but that's what he's came into, you know. It's, I'm not dissing him. It's just a Baptist phylactery. Calvary Chapel, we have our little phylacteries, right? Worn out Bibles and ultra casual clothing are Calvary Chapel. Isn't that right? And when I became a Calvary Chapel pastor, I had to put my Ryrie study Bible up, my Thompson Chain study Bible up. I had to put my MacArthur study. I had to get all my leather study Bibles. And I had to find a smaller leather Bible and I had to drive over it in a parking lot about 20 times before the Calvary guys out in California would even break bread with me. I don't know if you've ever been to a Calvary chapel out west. I mean, he's duct tape holding them together. It's like, holy cow, that guy must really love God. Did you see that duct tape on his Bible? That's awesome. It's, the, it's not a scripture saying you don't have to buy a new Bible, right? <clears throat> Especially as you get older, I have to get bigger Bibles because, I, you know, the ones I started off, I can't even read the print anymore. All right? So I don't have a big leather study Bible to impress you, although this is genuine cowhide. <laughs> Let's see here. What other kind of uh, phylacteries? Well, the seeker churches, they have their phylacteries, skinny jeans and cool tattoos, Right? You go in there dressed in anything other than skinny jeans and cool tattoos, and what happens next? Oh, we don't think you understand grace, pal. <laughs> right? They start judging you and everything. Uh, let's see. Mormons have their bicycles. That would be their phylacteries. Uh, Catholics have their robes, and I don't know what kind of hats you call that stuff the Pope's been wearing, man. But I, I was looking at these, I was like, who makes all this stuff? You know, these ornate robes. And uh, Last night in this 
festival of families or whatever. The wind was blowing, and part of his little caped robe thing kept blowing up over his head. And I was thinking, you know, that's easy now. If you have a Catholic background, I'm not making fun of your guy. Well, I'm not, no, no more than I'm making fun of everybody, I guess is what I ought to say, right? But, you know, the little robe thing blows up over his head, and one of the bishops comes behind him, and hey, let me straighten that out for you there, you know? That's, that's, that's their phylacteries. These are the outward expressions of our devotion to God that we want others to see. Verses 6 and 7, back to the Pharisees now, says they love the best places and they love the best seats in the synagogues. Do you notice that in verse 6? They love this preferential treatment. They love their titles. They loved the best seats. It is amazing how a title can change a person. In the early years of ministry, you know, I appointed some guys to be deacons. And I mean, immediately they thought it was their job to make my life a living hell. It was just ridiculous. I was like, what happened to you guys? You were nice guys until we gave you a little title. Now you're walking around trying to bully everybody with your little titles. I, I hate the titles. Uh, the word for best seats there in verse 6, if you're taking notes, the Greek word is proto-cathedria. We get the word cathedral from that. Cathedral. That means the preeminent place. These guys loved the cathedrals. Now, in the early years of ministry, I had a real fascination with church architecture. In fact, uh, Tam got me this big, cool, hardback book. I still have it. It's got all of these beautiful cathedrals worldwide. But do you know what an observation of mine? The more elaborate and ornate the cathedral, the more lifeless the ministry within typically is. When you find something that's just stripped down, bare bones, just a building that you'll find some life in there. In fact, if you go across Europe today, many of the great cathedrals have been sold and they've made them into you know, discotheques and dance clubs and dance halls and all, all kinds of crazy things in some of these beautiful cathedrals today. But these guys loved the preeminent place, the cathedral, the best seats in the house. Verses 8 through 10, Jesus says, guys, listen, I want you to avoid titles. Don't call people rabbi, don't call people teacher, and don't call people father. Well, that kind of hits a nerve, doesn't it? I would prefer that you guys call me the supreme silverback. <laughs> kidding. Jesus says, I don't really care for all these titles. Don't forget, you guys are just brothers and sisters to each other. Yeah, but what about pastors? And Hey, I'm just using my spiritual gift to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And you're using your spiritual gifts to, to, to encourage one another, to serve one another, to give and hospitality and all of those types of things. Jesus says, I want you to avoid titles. You don't, it's not that descriptive terms are bad necessarily because the New Testament is full of words like apostle and prophet and evangelist and pastor and teacher and elder and deacon and so forth. We need all those offices, but we just don't need to have all that printed on signs. You understand? Jesus is con condemning this pride and this pretense that I'm so-and-so, right? Someone hold the door for me as I walk out, right? Best seats in the house, most ornate clothing and all of this so that everyone knows I'm the big kahuna here, right? Now, when I arrived at this church, a little over four years ago, everybody wanted to know, how, how do we refer to you? And I said, well, you can call me Pastor Philip, or you can just call me Philip, you know? Now that we have a, what I, you know, see is a more healthy church atmosphere, I would say to all, all of you, just call me Philip, if you're my age or older. If you're a kid, you don't get to call me Philip, <laughs> right? You're not my equal, you're still a kid, Right? For those that are younger than me, right, we've got to teach kids a little bit of respect and for elders and all that, right? That's something that's been lost over time. I, I, maybe that's not a big deal to you, but I've always taken issue with kids calling adults by their first name. 
Like you hadn't been through what they've been through. You show them a little respect, right? So, but if you're my age or older, just call me Philip, right? I don't. It didn't have to call me Pastor Philip. Now I understand why people do that. It's 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 it's, it's not the title. It's just a descriptive term to see. You know, people are like who's the pastor here? Well, you're going to be surprised, but that's him over there, <laughs> right? And Jesus says, I don't really care for all these titles and all of this. Don't call people by all this stuff. Isn't it amazing the very things that Jesus told, told us not to do? You see that happening all across the world. We call everybody rabbi. We call everybody teacher. We call everybody father, right? An Anglican priest friend back in Tennessee, Father Ray Cash. And uh, one of the first guys that showed me grace way back in my early ministry days. I mean, nobody else would even talk to me back then because I was non-denominational. But Ray became a real friend to me, you know. And I said, you know, what do I call you? He said, that's, 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 we're peers. Call me Ray. I thought, well, that's, that's great that you, you know, you're not hung up on the title thing here. And Jesus in verses 11 and 12 say, hey, instead of titles, just be a servant to each other. Don't try and exalt yourself. Exalt yourself. Just stay humiliated and then he'll elevate you at the proper time and place. Stay humiliated? Yeah. We don't like to be humbled. Do we? And Jesus says, if you'll stay in a place of humiliation, if you'll stay in the lesser place, I'll lift you out of that place. But if you try and lift yourself up to this, you know, everyone look at me and look at how I am and all this, then you're going to be put back down, right? So don't exalt yourself. And the rest of the chapter, I mean, there's just exclamation point after exclamation point as he says, woe to you hypocrites and you blind guides and you fool and you blind and, right? I mean, look at all of that. Look at verse 17, for instance. Fools and blind. In the Greek, moros, we get the word moron from that. Moron. It also means blockhead, dull, and stupid. See, last week I, I finished the teaching with, you know, they, they keep trying to entrap him with their little tricky questions. And he finally says, well, you know, David called the Messiah Lord. And who, I mean, he, he kind of shut him down and said, quit asking me all these stupid questions, right? I'm sure there was somebody here that thought, I, think, I don't think that Jesus would ever use the word stupid. Well, you're just wrong. Because he calls these guys fools and blind in verse 17. In the Greek, morons, blockheads, dull-witted, stupid people. That's harsh language. And the, the exclamation points, really, you know, I mean, and, and the, why is he using all these exclamation points? Because he's so angry at those that mislead people that are seeking him. Now think about that. The reason Jesus is so upset with the spiritual leaders of that day is they were misleading people that were actually seeking God. That's one of God's biggest pet peeves. In verse 14, he says, greater condemnation, right? You will receive greater condemnation. These hypocrites that took widows' homes and, 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 and all of this. Jesus says the worst places in hell are reserved for those that take advantage of the defenseless, for those that mislead people that are actually looking for me. And there's some of you, you didn't know that there are worse places in hell. You thought, well, hell's hot and heaven's happy and fun and I definitely want to go to the fun place and stay away from the hot place, right? There are degrees of torment in this place called hell. And the worst places in hell are reserved for people that mislead folks who are seeking God. Verse 4, 15, he mentions the word proselyte. You travel in and see to win one proselyte. And what is a proselyte? Well, this was a Gentile convert to Judaism. This was somebody that wanted to become Jewish. And he said, you, you guys will go anywhere to try and bring somebody into your system. And you'll make him twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves are. 
Verses 16 through 22, they swore by all these different things. And the reason Jesus even deals with that is because that was like a little loophole for them. If we swear, swear by this or that, that gives us a justification for lying. And Jesus said, hey, swearing by any of that stuff is tantamount to swearing to God himself. You guys have found your little loophole that you think gets you in the clear. And, and this is Jesus saying, God's going to bust you for all of these swearing and not following through with stuff. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay... What's that next word? Come on, what is it? Tithe. One more time. Tithe. There you go. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. That was the herb garden. These guys were so uptight about tithing. If you've ever seen any of these herbs, just tiny little seeds, they would strain their eyes with tweezers to count nine grains of cumin, one grain of to the Lord. They wanted to make sure they didn't cheat God of the tithe of the smallest, most insignificant thing. That's how obsessive they were about tithing. And Jesus says, you pay your tithe, you're obsessive about that, but you've neglected justice and mercy and faith, which is obviously greater stuff to God. But don't miss what he's saying at the end of verse 23. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now say amen if you're still listening. Amen. There are some of you today and you, you don't believe in tithing. I'm telling you based on verse 23, you disagree with Jesus. He told them they ought to tithe on their mint garden, their anise, their cumin. In other words, you, you, none of that's negated. That's just not nearly as important as justice and mercy and faith. And can I tell you that the people that always say that we're not, you know, we're under grace, we don't have to tithe, they are never people that give excessively. They think of themselves as giving ex excessively, but if you look at their paid checks, if you look at their giving at the end of the year, they don't give the bare minimum, which was the tithe in the Old Testament. Do you know that if everyone that called themselves a follower of Jesus Christ in this church tithed, we would have no problem meeting our budget, supporting missionaries, adding staff members, doing more benevolent work to help the poor in the community. I mean, you know, the Pope was talking about how we need to help the poor in the community. You know why we can't help the poor in the community? Because people don't tithe. You don't give. Oh, you give something. But if you give anything less than 10%, you're still stealing from God. Right? He says, because I gave you the gifts and the abilities to, to, to work and earn an income out of gratitude that I gave you your great job and I gave you your great skill set and I, I gave you this great pay and all of this... The first dollar out of every ten dollars you give to me first. And if you'll honor me with that, you'll always have plenty. I mean, ask someone in this room that's been tithing for years, right? Ask, ask if they have suffered and gone without repeatedly. And what do you, you know what you're going to find? People that give faithfully and regularly... They're always doing fine. Always doing fine. People that are struggling, that have money problems, God is not God of their finances. And it's not an intellectual thing. Because some of them have been in the church most of their life. They've heard a million sermons on it. It is a heart thing, isn't it? Jesus says, these guys tithe. And that's good. They ought to do that. But they've neglected justice and mercy and faith. Now think about how those things are lacking today. Justice, mercy, and faith. There's very little faith in the church today. There's not a whole lot of mercy either. Right? 
And we say we want justice. But what we really mean is, God, anyone that goes against me, knock them down. But if I do something against them, Lord, I need a little mercy. I mean, if they knew what I was going through, they'd go easier on me. Right? That's not justice. That's asking the judge to wink at you and really come down hard on somebody else. These guys were so obsessive about the wrong stuff. Verse 24, he called them blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What, what does it mean, straining? Uh, that, that they, would put, they would pour cloth, uh, they would put cloth over a cup and then they'd pour the wine in to keep from swallowing a gnat. Why were they so worried about gnats? Because everything had to be drained of its blood before it could be consumed. And a gnat's too small to drain the blood out of it, right? So you're eating something that's not kosher. And Jesus says, you're so worried about eating an unkosher gnat, but you eat unkosher camels. Because you've got the wrong mindset about all of this. Verses 25 through 28 are the verses that hit me the most where I live. I don't know whether it's going to hit you that way. Uh, listen as I read. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, First, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. And woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. There's the person you think I am. There's the person I want you to think I am. And then there's the person God knows I am. And what do we do? We all want to be thought more spiritual than we really are. So we clean up the outside of the cup rather than the other way around. There was a brother that came to Christ here just recently. And I didn't recognize him that when he came back to church. Why? Because he cut all of his hair off. Already starting to clean the outside of the cup. I want you to know, I don't care about the length of your hair. I don't think the Lord cares about that kind of stuff either. I think he cares about our heart. I think he wants to change us from the inside out, right? There's the you that God sees. There's the you that you project to everyone around you. Right? I just, it is so hard for us to just let it all hang out at Calvary Chapel. Now, I think we're doing a tremendous job by comparison. I mean, you know, there are other churches in the community where I really think you have to put on your game face, your Sunday best, and come in and act like everything's great. I think that we are really working against all of that in a nice way. But we've still got some more come and clean to do around here, don't we? Right? And we, you know, we were putting up this fence yesterday at the, the children's playground area. Um, one of the brothers was talking about a problem we were going to have, straightening the row out or whatever. You can do it this way, but you're going to have a hell of a time with this, such and so, Right? And I love that he had the freedom to speak exactly as he would speak around a bunch of men. The problem is when we think we got to clean it up when we come in here. Well, am I trying to make this into a cussing church? <laughs> I don't care about that kind of stuff. That is not what makes you right or wrong in God's eyes. Now, is there a place for it? Well, absolutely. We don't want little kids walking around saying, hell, rah, 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 rah. right? That's not what, we're, what I'm after either. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we've got to get to the place where we're just real with one another. I mean, don't try and hide all your crazy. Let it all out. <laughs> Let it all out around here, right? Just be yourself among us. We will learn to love you, and when we see that you're not perfect, 
That gives all of us the freedom to just be ourselves as well. And then we have the choice. Are we going to take the high road and pray for each other? Or are we going to take the low road and start gossiping and putting each other down? See, that's a fellowship test there. Everybody wants to be thought of as great. And Jesus speaks to these guys and says, you look like these whitewashed tombs. They look so clean and wholesome, but there's nothing but death on the other side of the stone there. It's just terrible, terrible, terrible. And isn't it something how a little coat of paint can make something look better than it is? Wow. Now, everybody thinks they can do and would do better than those who came before them. And that's what Jesus is speaking about in verses 29 and 30. He says, you guys think that you would do better than your fathers. In other words, uh, you know, the, the Baptists have gone astray, but we're not going to go astray in Calvary Chapel. The Catholic Church has gone astray, but we're not going to go astray the evangelical churches. And, right? Everybody's so quick to criticize those who came before us and say, well, maybe our father stoned the prophets and did all this, but we wouldn't do that. If, if, if we were the ones that came up during that time, oh, no, no, we would act much better. And there's an arrogance in that that suggests that we wouldn't atrophy the same way every other great move, movement has done. And we condescend this denomination or that, not remembering how mightily God worked through them in their time. I tell you what, the last few Calvary Chapel Senior Pastors Conferences that I attended, and this is when Chuck was still alive, I remember thinking, man, we're already on the path. We're on this path. Pastor Philip, why would you say that? Because we got together and crowed about how wrong everybody else was and how we're doing it better. And once you start thinking that way, listen, once we're focusing on everybody else's problems... We've gotten off course, haven't we? Wow. We've just got to be concerned about, do, do we express who we are in the negative? Well, we don't believe in dancing. And we don't believe in drinking. And we don't believe in the mid-tribulation rapture of the church. And we don't believe in this. And we don't believe in that. Well, we know what you're against, but what are you actually for, knucklehead? Right? That's what Jesus would say. I mean, okay, we know you're against everything, but what are you actually for? What do you stand for? Share something positive, right? When we can no longer distinguish ourselves in the positive, we've moved that way. Listen, as I look at the Pharisees and how they, begun, how they had begun, do you know that Calvary Chapel pastors most closely resemble Pharisees of any movement in church history? Laymen, you don't have to have a lot of education. You don't have to come from a nice family and all this. You just have to be a hardcore biblicist. It's not a word, but that's kind of, we've made it, right? That's how the Pharisees became the Pharisees. Does that mean we shouldn't be men of the word, churches of the word? No, that means that we need to keep living what we're learning. And we've already gotten off the mark in that, Right? We're all taking notes, highlighting stuff, and we're not doing it. We're just highlighting stuff. You come every week to learn something, like a sponge that can't even soak anything else up. We've been soaking it up and soaking it up and soaking it up, right? You need to go out there and let him squeeze the sponge. And everything that he's been pouring into your life, you need to pour that into the lives of others. And you need to start living what you're learning. And Jesus warns that it's in their blood to do what their fathers have done. I mean, he's just laying it on them at the end of this. And he says this generation, I mean, the first martyr to the last martyr, he's going to hold them, that generation responsible for that. And do you know what happened? That generation, about 30 or 40 years later, 70 AD, the Roman general Titus came into Jerusalem and he leveled the city. He wiped it out. In fact, initially when he came in, he didn't want to destroy the temple. But somebody set a fire in the temple compound, and it got so hot in there like a furnace that it liquefied the gold, and it began to, 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 to fall between the cracks of the stones and everything. So he had his soldiers dismantle every single stone in the temple to get all that gold out. And Jesus is saying, 
you guys, Jerusalem, this generation, you're going to be held responsible for the death of Abel all the way back, you know, Adam and Eve's son, to the last of the Old Testament, Zechariah. I'm going to hold you responsible for all those martyrs. And then the last thing Jesus says, poor Jerusalem. Poor, poor Jerusalem. That's what verse 37 means. Jesus had such a heart for this city. And do you know that he still has a heart for the city of Jerusalem today? God's word says that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we see things happening in the world today. There's turmoil in the Middle East. There are so many signs at the times I wouldn't know where to begin to lay it all out for you. Now the United Nations talking about globalization, one world, peace, everybody needs to come together. It's amazing the times that we're living in, the things that we're seeing happening, developing right in front of us. We need to keep our eyes on Jerusalem because that lets us know what will happen next. Isn't that right? Jesus says, poor Jerusalem. You kill the prophets and you stone those that are sent to you. One day you're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One day their eyes are going to be open. They're going to realize that Jesus was the Messiah. They missed him the first time. And they're going to cry out and weep and he's going to wipe away their tears. Now I'd like you to bow your heads. And as we prepare our hearts now for the Lord's Supper, I want you to take an inventory of your walk. You see, we all have a little bit of that hypocrite, Pharisee, wanting to look good to others when we know we're not. And one of the most dangerous things that we can do is just to keep learning stuff that we're not doing. The point of today's Bible study is not to make you feel bad about um, this or that. But to get all of us to a place where we humble ourselves, ask the Lord to forgive us for pretending that we're better than we are. And to help us by His grace to love God and love others the way Jesus does. Because the Pharisees, they like to control people. and They like to be thought well of. They liked nice trappings of religion and all of that. They didn't really love God. They didn't love the people. And the easiest way for us to move away from the Pharisees' mentality and closer to that of Christ himself is to start loving anybody because you're loved infinitely by the Father. So as Calvin plays, this is your time to contemplate God's Word and to do business with God. Whatever He's telling you you need to do, just do it. Just be quick to obey, quick to surrender, quick to uh, seek reconciliation and restoration with God. He already knows everything going on in your life. So he won't be shocked by what you're about to share with him.